Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, fifth annual congress of the Sri Lanka Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders, SLIC trims. Um, once again, we are honored by the presence of the team from the European Charcoal Foundation. Um, so we are kicking off with the European Chaco Foundation Symposium. Uh, so I would like to thank Professor Komi for coming here again uh, to Sri Lanka. I think this is his fourth trip uh, to Sri Lanka along with uh, uh, Professor Leticia Leocani. Um, along with uh, both of them, uh, for the first time, uh, Xavier Montalban Professor Montalban is here as well from Spain um, as part of the ECF uh, symposium, the ECF team. And of course, uh, um, Hans-Peter Hartung. Peter has been here last time, so we are very honored and privileged to have you once again in Sri Lanka. Uh, in addition to the ECF team, of course, we have uh, Professor Kasu Fujihara, uh, who's probably the most uh, well-known uh, foreign neurologist in Sri Lanka, who has been to this country multiple times from 2012. So Professor Fujihara, once again, has been uh, uh, very kind to uh, visit us and come to this session. And of course, uh, I would like to also welcome uh, our good friend from neighboring India, Professor Leka Pandit. Uh, who was here, uh, again, I must say that she was first here in 2012 on my invitation, and she's been here uh, last, I think, for the first Slick Dreams as well in 2019. So, Leka, thank you so much for being here. So, I think uh, I will hand over the mic to Professor Komi uh, for an initial introduction. Professor uh, Yaki, it's really a very great honor for the European Chaco Foundation to open the activities of the fifth uh, annual Congress of Selectrims. Uh, it's for us uh, a privilege to be in such a condition and uh, I take also the opportunity to thank all the uh, members of the board of the European Chaco Foundation who are here and accepted the invitation to participate. I think it is a very special time for multiple sclerosis. Uh, we are in a time where the, the evolution of a lot of concepts are uh, under discussion. So, and I think that uh, in also in the session that uh, we are now starting, uh, there will be such an opportunity to uh, approach some of these uh, changes that are underway. So having said that, I think we can uh, go directly to the scientific activities. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we will start the ECF symposium with the first uh, talk on new diagnostic criteria, where we are and where we go, uh, by S Professor Xavier Montalban from Spain. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here in this uh, beautiful country, my first time. I hope not to be the last. So um, uh, I will be talking about the new diagnostic criteria, where we are, where we go. This is my disclaimer slide. So of course, we, we want to um, make a very early diagnosis and also very accurate diagnosis because this has uh, clear implications in the long-term prognosis, probably through an early treatment. And we have been using a number of uh, different criteria over time. You have here um, almost most of them. And nowadays we are using the McDonald 2017. Let me just check if this is working. Uh, no, really. Uh, and, and there are a number of statements, but I just pick four of them. One, uh, we, we require symptoms suggestive of multiple sclerosis to make the diagnosis. 
Second, we require dissemination in time and space. Well, in 2017, we made the variation of that. Uh, if you remember, and in 2017, we said, well, if you have dissemination in space plus oligogonal bands, that's enough to make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. We also require exclusion of other diseases. This is still mandatory, of course. And another statement is that diagnosis can be made by clinical assessment alone. And I will try to challenge a number of these statements and I will update you about the last meeting we had. Of course, the MRI, when the, the MRI appeared, everything changed in neurology, specifically multiple sclerosis, and a number of proposals were published. The first one by Peity in 1988 and also Vasikas in 1988 they propose a number of um, MRI abnormalities to make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Then we had the Barkov Tintoret criteria uh, 10 years later, in fact. And uh, what we are still using nowadays in the 2017 criteria come from the Magnims criteria published in Lancet Neurology 2007. Here you have the DIS criteria to have a list one titulation in at least two of the typical topographies being preventricular, uh, juxtacortical. Let me just see if I can uh, at least. Um, is the pointer working with this? But I don't see anything here. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, preventricular lesions, as you can see here, juxtacortical lesions, infradentorial and a spinal cord, as you can see here. So having one titulation in, in two, uh, at least two of the typical topographies, that means dissemination in space. For dissemination in time, we are still using, again, the Magnims criteria that were published in 2009. So a new T2 on follow-up MRI or the simultaneous presence of asymptomatic GAT enhancing and non-enhancing lesions at any time. That means dissemination in time. And this is what we are using now, the 2017 criteria of um, uh, McDonald. So we met um, in November last year in Barcelona for the 2023 McDonald criteria revision. This is the timeline. It was not an easy process, to be honest. Um, we, we, were, uh, the, we proposed uh, the revision of the McDonald criteria in 2021. Then during the, the 2022, we reviewed carefully all the evidence by full clinical trials committee. Um, in 2023, the sponsors approved the revision meeting and then we, we um, met in Barcelona in November, December last year. So uh, the meeting was convened by the International Advisory Committee on Clinical Trials in Multiple Sclerosis, was sponsored by ECRIMS and the National MS Society US, and we had a steering committee that you can see here. We met um, uh, 56 international experts met there, and um, uh, all the uh, continents were represented, uh, about 16 countries. The gender balance was not perfect, but um, we had 33 males, 23 females. This is the, the picture of the group. As you can appreciate, Giancarlo Comi is around here, Hans Peter is around here, among many others. So we had a number of areas to be considered for revision. One was the, the need for uh, dissemination in time. Do we really need that? The second one was the optic nerve as a fifth topography. The use of uh, specific uh, MRI signs as, such as the CBS or the PRLs as potential imaging features for diagnosis. Refinement of dissemination space criteria. What about the radio radiologically isolated syndrome? Is that a mess or is not a mess? So some considerations in relation to age and comorbidities pediatric MS, primary progressive MS, and also uh, the use of some biomarkers. So we use a consensus methodology. Uh, we require 90% of meeting participants voting uh, on a specific statement with uh, at least 80% agreement to be accepted. So let me just um, 
comment a little bit, a uh, few of them, not all of them, but few of them. So the, the first one is, should optic nerve be included as the fifth typical topography for the demonstration of dissemination in space? Uh, to me or to us, I think it looks, uh, it is very logical because uh, optic neuritis is the first manifestation of multiple sclerosis in about 30% of patients with MS. You can, you can check the involvement of MRI, uh, sorry, of optic nerve by MRI, by visual bulk potentials or by OCT. In fact, Magnims proposed in 2016 to include the optic nerve as an additional region to demonstrate dissemination in space, but at the 2017 criteria, we consider that looks, looks very sensible, but uh, we didn't have um, enough um, data, enough evidence at that specific time point. With the uh, MRI, uh, you can see uh, images in the optic nerves in 84% of symptomatic and 38% of asymptomatic optic nerves. Um, you can also observe in 95% of cases with op acute optic neuritis enhancing of the optic nerves. And at the end, 78% of MS patients without clinical symptoms, they do have some um, degree of um, optic nerve involvement demonstrated by MRI. Let me show you um, a couple of uh, papers uh, published uh, more recently coming from our center in Barcelona. This is Dr. Anka Vidal. She published this paper in Neurology 2021, indicating that using um, the uh, visual bulk potential to demonstrate dissemination in space increase uh, sensibility. I don't, I don't know if, if you can see it here, sensitivity, but, but without decreasing specificity. And then a recent paper in neurology, again by Anka Vidal, using now the three tools we have, uh, OCT, visual bulk potential, and, and, and um, an MRI, demonstrated that the addition of the optic nerve as a fifth topography to fulfill dissemination of space um, is appropriate to be considered in the next revision of the McDonald criteria. Another, another um, topic, uh, what about the role of uh, some biomarkers, for instance, neurofilaments in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? Again, let me just show you a couple of papers coming from our center. This is by uh, Dr. Georgina Rambide. She, she published that pa patients with CIS with high levels of neurofilaments converted to multiple sclerosis in a higher proportion than those uh, without uh, increased levels of neurofilaments. Also uh, happened the same thing with RIS. So uh, those patients who had increased levels of neurofilaments converted in a higher proportion. This is coming as well from our, from our lab. But still, uh, we, I think that the neurofilaments as a diagnostic tool uh, in a specific uh, patients, in individuals, is not really ready to go. What about kappa free light change? Uh, can be they can, can be them equivalent to oligoconal bands? And uh, as you know, there are, uh, there is an excess of kappa and lambda free light change uh, in a number of um, neuroimmunological conditions, uh, and they could be of uh, interest in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis because they are. They, you can produce that, you can determine that rapidly and also in a quantitative way, and this is a huge difference with uh, oligoconal bands. We published your genome video as well uh, with Carmen Espejo from our lab. We published this paper in, in Brain, and if you can see here, oligoconal bands are good to demonstrate, to, um, uh, to indicate the the um, uh, probability of converting to multiple sclerosis, but uh, kappa free light change ratios were even better and much better than the uh, IgG index. And there is a number of papers and consensus statement indicating that this is the case. Let me, let me just um, uh, challenge a couple of concepts. The first one is that according to the 2017 diagnostic criteria, diagnosis can be made by clinical assessment alone. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you go to the paper, you read this, if you have two clinical attacks and objective clinical evidence of at least two lesions, that's a mess, and you don't require any additional data. 
Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is uh, correct. So uh, this is a real example. This is a female, 42 years, with an optic neuritis, uh, and then a diplopia with left six cranial nerve palsy. Uh, of, uh, she, nothing was uh, discovered, uh, everything was uh, ruled out. However, uh, her MRI, uh, brain and spinal cord MRI, was completely normal and the CSF was negative. So who can say that this is uh, multiple sclerosis? I don't think we can. Uh, be aware that, uh, at least in our hands, 4% of patients with CIS and a normal brain baseline MRI had lesions in the, um, in the following year. So a little bit of caution here. Another concept is this one. Is DIS in patients with symptoms enough to diagnose multiple sclerosis? Do, do we require anything else? If you, if you go to the paper in publishing brain uh, that lead to the inclusion of oligogonal bands in the 2017 diagnostic criteria, you realize that patients with DIS plus oligogonal bands, the hazard ratio of conversion is very high. But if you go up, you realize as well that patients with DIS without oligogonal bands, with negative oligogonal bands, the hazard ratio is also very high. And also, if you go up, patients with an abnormal MRI without fulfilling DIS criteria and oligogonal bands, uh, they also have a higher, higher, higher uh, ratio uh, for conversion to multiple sclerosis, and I, I can go even up there, uh, even with um, just few lesions in the MRI, typical lesions, nothing, nothing else, the hazard ratio is very high. So, and then another way of looking to the same problem is if you go to the CIS trials over time, you realize that most of the patients who had a CIS plus an abnormal MRI no matter the, the, if they had dissemination in time or oligogonal bands, they converted to multiple sclerosis. So uh, the most important finding for the diagnosis of MS is the demonstration of dissemination in space. You, we can discuss about the criteria with typical lesions in the MRI, and that's a key word as well, typical lesions. That these are the typical lesions, so preventricular lesions here, juxtacortical, cortical lesions here and here, uh, pons, uh, peripheral lesions here in the, in the brainstem, the middle cerebellar peduncles, the corpus callosum, uh, short uh, lesions in the uh, spinal cord, mainly lateral and posterior, uh, open ring enhancement, the CBS, central vein sign, and PRLs, as you can see here. So these are typical lesions uh, for multiple sclerosis, and this is what we have to look for. And we know how they are, and they are very well described. So um, we don't have to invent too many things. So which is the role, if we are talking about MRI, about um, uh, specific signs, which is the role of CVS and PRLs in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? You know that um, there is a perivenular or peri, uh, yeah, perivenular inflammatory um, infiltrates, which are very characteristic of multiple sclerosis, and you have the avoid lesion, the dorsal finger, and some of them using the right sequences, the, the susceptibility weighted images, you can see a, a central vein. So um, the, the presence of CVS uh, in, uh, is well established in all phenotypes of multiple sclerosis. You can demonstrate them using uh, not only seven Tesla or three Tesla MRI, but also 1.5, Tesla MRI. Um, it's not pathognomotic at all, but it's quite characteristic if you find enough number of uh, CBS. Now, I think uh, most of the papers um, are claiming that six CBS is the magical number. What about PRLs? It's high specific, but the sensitivity is very poor or poor. Uh, but it's very useful. If you find PRLs, probably this is going to be uh, multiple sclerosis. Be, be aware of uh, Sussex syndrome. Uh, they, they may have also PRLs. So, and then a complex topic, RIS, radiological isolated syndrome, should be included in the diagnostic phenotype criteria classification. Uh, uh, um, well, uh, I think if you go to the criteria, you require symptoms to make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis nowadays. 
And uh, you, you require, in fact, typical CIS, and we can discuss that. And in the phenotype classification published in 2014, RIS was not included, was not included at all. So, but who, have, uh, who has any doubt that this patient with headache, no symptoms suggestive of multiple sclerosis, but such a number of typical lesions have MS? I think nobody. So the problem is where you put the, the threshold, right? This is what we have nowadays. Uh, the 2017 criteria require clinical, um, clinical symptoms uh, in the form of relapses or progression to make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, but now with the 2023 criteria, probably we're going to the left, and some of the patients with RIS will be considered to have multiple sclerosis as well. So where do you put the threshold to consider MS in a patient with RIS? Here, just uh, one typical lesion in uh, RIS, if that's enough to make the diagnosis? Probably not. We require perhaps one typical lesion in the spinal cord, that's very specific of MS, plus oligogonal bands, or perhaps we would like to have dissemination space, plus dissemination type, mass oligogonal bands, or we can be even more stringent. So uh, I, think, I think this is a, this is a very uh, important uh, topic to be discussed in the, in the diagnostic criteria. The, there are a number of uh, clinical implications here. So in, in 2017, uh, and here you have the um, phenotypes, some of the CIS patients fulfill criteria for MS, but not all of them, of course. So CIS is a concept, yeah, right? It's a patient with a first episode suggestive of demyelinating disease. We don't require an abnormal MRI, for instance. So many of them fulfill criteria for MS, but not all of them. What is going to happen in 2023? Uh, this will be the same, and also the R if, if RIS is incorporated, most of the patients will fulfill criteria for MS, I would say, or many patients will fulfill criteria for MS, but not all of them. So, uh, just uh, finishing my presentation, uh, the proposed revisions, and I can't give you too many details, they are under embargo yet, right? So uh, that you forgive me, but I can tell you that dissemination is in time is not longer needed uh, there, there is a need of paraclinical evidence to diagnose multiple sclerosis, so something, you have to demonstrate something apart from, the, from symptoms. Optic nerve may be included as a fifth topography. We uh, have updated the DIS criteria. We have uh, add, added uh, CBS and PRLs and optional tools in some uh, situations. RIS is going to be considered a mess uh, in a specific situations. We, are, we will be using more strict features for confirming diagnosis in individuals over 50 or with uh, headache uh, disorders or with vascular disorders. Laboratory tests, specifically anti-mog antibodies for confirming diagnosis in children and adolescents probably will be mandatory. And we, we, we will have additional imaging features for PPMS diagnosis and uh, kappa free light change uh, probably will be another tool to be used for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So um, this is the, the meeting, this is the my city. Uh, it's, uh, in, in some aspects it's as uh, beautiful as your beautiful country as well. And this is uh, my group in Barcelona. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. I think uh, that's really a very hot topic because uh, based on what we heard from you, uh, it, it is clear that we are moving in the direction of uh, an earlier diagnosis, maintaining a good level of uh, specificity. So just a question to you. Um, the uh, probably the, from the methodological point of view, the central vein sign and the PRL are the two um, more delicate aspects because they are quite depending on uh, 
the MRI modality and the ability to pick up this type of uh, uh, condition. Uh, what is your uh, view about that and particularly uh, the six uh, magic number for uh, the uh, slowly expanding lesion is in your opinion enough in order to protect from some uh, uh, low specificity? Yeah. Thank you very much, Giancarlo, for the question. I, uh, I agree. Let me clarify that um, um, CBS and PRLs will not be mandatory in most situations. So uh, that means that not everybody will be, because not everybody will be able to perform a, you know, a careful MRI using that sequence, etc. So uh, that will allow, uh, in very simple words, that will allow in specific centers, very much uh, specialized in multiple sclerosis, to make the diagnosis in patients with a few conditions, uh, and not in other centers. I, I give you that. However, I think that will be useful in, in many centers. And uh, six seems to be the magical number. So you, we reviewed the, as you were there, we reviewed the evidence. And apparently, six CBS give you a lot of trust uh, in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. PRLs were, were, were a little bit more controversial. Uh, that was a surprise to me, because PRLs apparently are more specific than CBS. But we, we had a number of uh, controversies there in the meeting. And uh, they were not accepted as much as CBS were. So I think uh, the, in, the, in the following years, we'll have more and more data. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we don't see the CVS very much in this country. Is there any uh, specific uh, sequence that you do to detect it? Yes, you, you, you need the, the SUI, susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, to see the, the, the veins. And, uh, but you, you don't need to do it Typically, if you have a typical CIS patient or a typical patient with MS with a, with a right lesions, we don't need to we, we don't need to use that that sequence. Only in patients where you have uh, uh, doubts, uh, mainly in older patients with vascular risk factors, I would say there the presence of CVS could be very helpful. Thank you. So you can even detect it with three Tesla or one point five Tesla. Yes, yes, that's for sure, which is an advantage, yeah. I think the, the, the new version of the criteria we, uh, will allow uh, to make the diagnosis easier globally, so uh, it's not the, the other way around. So uh, the inclusion of the kappa free light change, for instance, uh, that makes you a little bit uh, independent from uh, very expert observers uh, in the oligogonal bands uh, technique and others, so the, the requirement for dissemination of space and time. So I think, I think they are easier to be applied globally. Uh, so forget a little bit about CBS and PRL. They are very specific. Although if you have a 1.5 uh, Tesla machine and you can use a SWE uh, sequence, that, 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 that's more than enough. And with regards to uh, the RIS patient you showed with the migraine uh, headache, uh, you do an MRI and you find all those classical lesions uh, and you still diagnose MS, and do you treat them? I don't know if I got the, the question well. So in, uh, in RIS, yes. uh, say the imaging was done for headache or yeah. migraine. Yeah. So you find these lesions, so what do you do for those patients? OK, that's another uh, different question. So one thing is that perhaps um, you have an RIS um, without clinical symptoms suggestive of multiple sclerosis. You perform an MRI, and you find typical lesions fulfilling specific criteria that we established in the, in the meeting. And then that you can say, this is a mess. So the next question in the clinical practice is that, should we treat that patient? Uh, uh, now this is not allowed, right? It's not in the label of any medication. Uh, but there are at least two trials indicating that early, very early treatment, Yakalo was the, one of the people claiming that early treatment was important in long-term prognosis, right? So early at the ARISE trial with the methylfumarate and also the terifunomide uh, trial indicates that you can reduce the, the percentage of uh, conversion to clinically 
the clinical multiple sclerosis in more than 80%. So I think the next step will be to treat these patients. Thank you, Professor Monterbel. Our next speaker is Professor Giancarlo Comi, who really does not need an introduction to this audience. I think it suffices to say that he's the president of the European Chalk Foundation. Over to you, Professor Comi. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, uh, what I would like to address uh, in the next uh, uh, 25 minutes is um, uh, I think a very important problem because what is still a major unmet need in MS is the possibility to treat uh, the progressive phase of the disease. Um, and there are a lot of evidences, uh, these are my disclosures, that uh, one of the reasons why we had so uh, big difficulties in uh, find a good treatment uh, also for the progressive MS is because our understanding about the pathophysiological mechanisms that are driving the progressive phase of the disease are still not perfectly clear. In this scheme, we can see typically that uh, we have a relapsing phase of the disease where we have wave of inflammation entering from the periphery, the central nervous system. But then, at a variable time, uh, you know, the fact that here we have this line that has quite different position over time in the evolution of the disease. So at a certain time, and maybe at a different time also from patient to patient, we start to see other mechanisms that are taking place in the central nervous system. Uh, which are mostly driven by uh, innate immunity, perhaps still with the contribution also of adaptive immunity at a variable degree, but for sure the innate immunity is now playing a role. So it is clear that the interventions that target uh, the uh, disease in the relapsing phase are at least partially different from those uh, able to intervene in the second phase, in the progressive phase of the disease. So then the key point is, as we have heard by Xavier Montalban, uh, early treatment for any type of pathophysiological mechanism active in MS is really fundamental. So even in the progressive phase, we have to consider that early treatment could be really uh, the key type of uh, 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 intervention to succeed. Um, so the point is, when does it start, the progressive phase of the disease? Typically, in the uh, way we classify multiple sclerosis, the progressive phase of the disease starts when we see that the accumulation of disability is becoming uh, the modality to uh, accumulate uh, problems. And it is an accumulation of disability which is independent from attacks, even if attacks may still uh, occur. So uh, then if we look, look at the scheme, classical scheme, this is the point where we start to have such an accumulation of disability. However, is this really true because this in some way is based on the concept uh, uh, and there are a lot of, um, uh, let's say, methodological aspects that uh, are inter uh, interacting in uh, the timing, which is this time where we start to have. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the problem of the way we categorize phenotypically the disease courses uh, but also there are a lot of uh, pathophysiological aspects that are very important. And finally, uh, we, we have also probably not enough sensitive tools to pick up uh, the uh, progression. And this will be uh, the second part of my talk. So what happened here is that uh, we had in the last uh, uh, four, five years, uh, some uh, papers that suggested that the beginning of progression is not 
taking place at a certain point after a more or long lasting phase of relapsing remitting disease. No, there were some evidences that the disease, the progressive phase of the disease may start even very early. And there are essentially two type of uh, observations that are suggesting. The first one was the coming from the uh, study performed uh, at the UCSF where they showed that if uh, we examine the evolution of brain atrophy, what we can see is that the increase of brain atrophy occurs not only in patients with uh, attacks, which is what we can expect because each attack has determining some focal damage, but also it occurs in patients where we don't see new lesions. Um, well, this is something more challenging because it means that there are some mechanisms that are not related to just the presence of wave of inflammation entering from the periphery. We, in our center, had the same observation using OCT with the optical clearance chromography. We have seen that, again, if the patient had attacks or new lesions, there was a, 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 a certain level of uh, progression of uh, damage at the retinal level. Nevertheless, some damage occurs also in patients without any evidence of uh, uh, disease activity. Again, suggesting that, at least in some people, this type of uh, uh, damage independent from attacks, independent from lesions, may occur. Then the second observation was by uh, Ludwig Kappos, uh, who, looking at uh, uh, the OPERA 1 and OPERA 2 clinical trials and examining the modality of disability accumulation in these two trials, he realized that um, uh, most of the patients who had some disability progression during the trial had such a disability progression independent from uh, the uh, uh, disease activity. And here you can see that clearly uh, the, a certain and, and relevant proportion of patients had such an event. And Ludwig Kappos defined this event PIRA, progression independent from relapse activity. Uh, which is a very new challenging concept because it uh, is a way to recognize, even just using a clinical observation, uh, the possibility of uh, some early uh, progression independent from attacks. And then, uh, of course, uh, there's a consequence, the fact that the progressive phase of the disease may be present since the very early phase of the disease. Um, other studies have confirmed uh, this type of phenomenon. However, uh, this is the study by Fred Lablin. Uh, Fred Lablin uh, collected a very large population, more than uh, 20,000 patients, uh, coming from clinical trials and also some observational studies. And he found, and this is the area in green, that the proportion of patients who might have such a condition is around 4%. So is a number which is completely different from the number that has been seen in the OPERA 1 and OPERA 2 where the value was uh, of the order of 30-40%, uh, 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 which is the major difference? Well, the major difference is that uh, the criteria to classify PIRA as a real PIRA event uh, was uh, by Fred Lablin more specific because he required that such an increase of disability independent from attacks in order to be a real peer should be confirmed at the end of the observation. So, in other words, you can have a lot of peer events that are reversible. Only those who are not reversible can really be considered uh, as a, an evidence of uh, disability progression. There are a lot of other as methodological aspects uh, because uh, uh, it depends a bit in the way we define PIRA and there are a lot of different possibilities. I 
don't want to go in details about that, but what is more important is to consider that there are a lot of factors that may influence PIRA. Uh, essentially, the true PIRA has to be an event of increase of disability, which is persisting over time, even better if it is uh, increasing in terms of numbers over time, um, and also is independent not only from attacks, but also from the occurrence of some new MRI activity at the time of the increase of disability. Um, uh, there have been a lot of other studies. I want to be very short here. Uh, just to show you only on results of this Italian study, uh, because uh, in this Italian study, what was very interesting was that the PIRA concept was a bit more stress, and um, they, it has been shown that if uh, we look at the large population of uh, patients, about 50% of the patients have evidence of this uh, increase of disability, and in uh, about uh, half of them, the increase of disability is independent from attacks. However, only in those patients who had at least two events of PIRA confirmed at the end, there was a, a persisting increase in disability. You see that in patients with uh, uh, both PIRA or at least two peer events or, or with uh, uh, increase of disability related to attacks. The, uh, during the long-term observation, here we had more than 11 years of follow-up, there was a quite clear increase in disability, as you can see, a very similar, uh, independent from the mechanism. But in those patients with uh, only one event, only one PIRA, there was no increase of disability at the end of the long-term follow-up. Again, meaning that uh, we should be very restrictive in the definition of PIRA. I can show that. And this is the study uh, that has been replicated, this observation, um, uh, adding at the observation of the clinical activity, also the MRI activity. Here in the top is the proportion of uh, peer events, uh, and when we go to a better definition of attacks and when we add the observation of, uh, of uh, MRI activity, then the proportion of PIRA that we can define through PIRA is really decreasing uh, uh, quite uh, substantially. Um, so where is, what is the message? Well, the message is the, what uh, uh, I can summarize that the event of PIRA can be observed quite frequently. It has to be uh, better defined in order not to confound the PIRA that is due to some uh, uh, error in the evaluation of disability or due to some uh, uh, subclinical level of activity, the, two, the true PIRA. And the true PIRA is extremely interesting. You see here, this is a study again from the Montalban uh, group. And in, in this uh, type of uh, study, it, again, uh, depending on the way the PIRA was assessed, uh, the frequency uh, decreased substantially. But if you look here at the bottom, those patients who had a real true PIRA, independent from MRI activity persisting over time, then in this population, the risk of disability progression is really extremely high. So the message is then that um, uh, the disability independent from attacks, independent from activity, in some patients, not in, uh, in everybody, but in some patients start very early. This condition, of course, increase over the disease duration uh, that because, as you can expect, a proportion of patients who evolve to progressive MS increase uh, dramatically over time. However, if we pick up very early such a condition, then we can really have a big possibility to treat early the progressive phase and perhaps to be able to modify the disease course. 
So uh, treating and then how to uh, evaluate the response. Think about what already it may happen because already now we have some treatment that have some partial effect in progressive MS, but we hope in the future to have much more disease-modifying treatment for the progressive phase of the disease. So how we may evaluate the response to the treatment in the progressive phase, because here the condition is completely different from the relapsing phase. In the relapsing phase, typically, we examine if we have attacks, if we have persisting MRI activity, we can say, well, we are here facing a condition of treatment failure. But do we have also in progressive MS tools to estimate the response to the treatment? From the theoretical point of view, as you can see here, this is the list of the different type of uh, potential biomarkers. Uh, let's start from uh, the most simple one, the EDSS scale. Well, EDSS scale has a lot of limitation because uh, it is prim prim primarily uh, reproducing and, and describing an impact of uh, the ambulation on the disability. So it is a very focused way to look at the disability, at least uh, with the level of disability with score more than 4.5. And I think that in this way, we miss a lot of other uh, events that uh, may take place in the central nervous system and may produce some uh, dysfunction. Well, uh, in, in other ways, uh, EDSS is very insensitive to changes. One possibility is to improve our ability uh, using what is defined a composite score, so measuring these functions, so to add to EDSS and the ambulation, for example, the, um, a measure of the upper limb function, uh, nine or back test. If we use such an approach, we may clearly increase our ability to pick up increase in disability. And also we may, uh, you know, consider that in any case, uh, if we use such an approach, we increase a lot the sensitivity, but we decrease uh, dramatically the specificity. So the false uh, positive increase of disability in, uh, are becoming very relevant. And this is just to give you an idea how the different components may contribute no doubt that the, 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 uh, all these type of components uh, have a relevant impact on this. However, even in this approach, we still just look at performance, uh, which are essentially motor performances. So what else? Well, what else is that we can also add other measures like uh, measures of uh, cognition. This was what has been done uh, in a, in a very interesting approach uh, in uh, North America uh, is the MSOAC type of approach. And they showed that if we use this type of approach, if uh, we combine together all these type of uh, uh, different uh, measures, uh, we can be able to demonstrate that the combination of two measures have the same level of uh, 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 sensitivity that can be reached with uh, the use of the combination of the different scores. So this is an approach which is very interesting. There is a big limitation here that the time to perform all these tests is, is about one hour. That is really not something that we can really operate in the everyday clinical activity. The other possibility is to use uh, uh, smartphone sensor-based digital uh, assessment. This is a study by, uh, leaded by Xavier Montalban again, showing that uh, with this type of smartphone assessment, we can reach a quite good level of correlation with the more uh, classical measures of uh, performances, both for motor and also cognitive aspect. That's a very interesting approach, something that probably we will spend a lot in the future. Uh, also here we can even go far and to collect uh, a lot of data again, uh, as it has been uh, tried in a, in a 
in a multicenter study um, led by Biogen. Uh, unfortunately, again, this is good, but it is very complicated. The time required with the, such an approach is extremely uh, uh, long and uh, really not uh, feasible in the clinical practice. What about uh, the other measures? Uh, well, instrumental measures uh, here, we have first of all MRI. Uh, we have no time to go in details about this. I want to concentrate just on, on two or three aspects. Brain atrophy is, of course, what has been suggested and used also in some phase two and phase three clinical trials in progressive MS. There is a major limitation of this uh, brain volume loss. Uh, the estimation uh, the threshold for a change that has to be considered a, a significant change beyond the level of variability of that technique is 0.4%. Uh, unfortunately, this 0.4% is very close to the, uh, to the variability due to the methodology. So, uh, from the practical point of view, uh, even if uh, this type of measure, brain atrophy, has been used successfully in a lot of clinical trials, for example, in the Ibudilast trial, uh, as you can see here, there was a quite clear positive uh, value of brain atrophy to assess response. Nevertheless, when we look at the individual variation, these are lines that describe the individual variation over time of brain atrophy. You can see that there are incredible oscillations due to the methodological repositioning aspects. So unfortunately, it works only on the long-term observation, on a one or two year follow-up, uh, these type of changes are not really uh, informative. Um, I can skip this. What about the spinal cord? Spinal cord is extremely important because it has a high predictivity of the accumulation of disability. In a, in a study we performed some years ago, we demonstrated that if we perform such an estimation of the spinal cord atrophy along uh, the cervical tract of the spinal cord, we can clearly demonstrate that those patients who have increase of disability have more accumulation of spinal cord atrophy. Uh, which is perfect in terms of uh, group analysis. However, here again, if we examine individual oscillation, you can see the individual changes over time, it is clear that there is a tremendous variability, again, for obvious methodological uh, problems. So even if it is good for group analysis, it cannot be used as an assess um, assessment of the individual variation. What about the uh, very important new possible marker, that is the uh, active, persisting active uh, lesions? Uh, already pathology has revealed that uh, there is a quite large proportion of uh, lesions uh, are those here that you can see in orange. Uh, these uh, uh, are active, uh, persisting active lesions. And I think that uh, the MRI now has the possibility to pick up these lesions. Are the lesions that have been defined as a slow expanding lesion or PRL lesions? And uh, this can be measured, as we have seen before, by Xavier Montalban, and they tend to accumulate more frequently uh, in patients uh, with progressive MS compared to patients with relapsed and remitting MS. So they are not exclusively present uh, in uh, progressive MS, which is not surprising because we have seen already that uh, the mechanism of progression can be operative also very early. Um, the, the, this is a, a quite interesting approach. There have been a couple of studies that have shown that it may also be used in the clinical trials. Uh, however, we need really more uh, studies in order to, uh, to make possible to use this type of tools in all the centers. What else? Well, here, first of all, we have something new, which is uh, the contribution of positron emission tomography. Um, 
the use, for example, of uh, a ligand like the CPIB PET uh, is able to demonstrate the dynamic of the process of demyelination and remyelination. And here you can see in different colors, in blue and red, the lesions that are uh, uh, characterized by an increased uh, content of myelin and those characterized by a decreased content of myelin. That means those lesions who have or where there is a process of remyelination and those where we have a process of demyelination. And if you look at this figure, you have the impression that in the brain of a person with MS, you have a tremendous dynamic activity of demyelination and remyelination. Um, well, this is a, it a false impression because it's based on a, proto, on a patient with a very, very active condition. Other patients have much less. And again, in another study, they look at the same type of uh, 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 analysis at completely different values. And this uh, is another possibility, that is the use of uh, the TSPO PET in order to examine the dynamic of uh, uh, um, inflammation over time, both in normal appearance matter and in the, in, in, in the lesion. That's really a very interesting approach. Uh, uh, with some possibility to predict the response to the long term. I can ship this. I, I will now accelerate in order to close, but there is um, not so much to say. Optical clearance tomography uh, has a good sensitivity, has a good specificity. Uh, it reflects a bit what happened in the central nervous system. However, it is also influenced by what happened locally in the optic nerve. So uh, it could be used in the long term to monitor the disease, but we need more data about that. Uh, I will skip this. What about, and I go to the end, what about the patient reported outcomes? Patient reported outcomes are becoming very important because it is a way to try to capture subtle changes that cannot be captured by any type of instrumental test. There are some evidences that um, this type of prompts uh, uh, may be very important and very useful, particularly in progressive MAS. And uh, a very recent study has shown that in progressive MAS, there is a quite clear uh, influence and relationship of uh, the patient reported outcomes, quality of life, and other aspects of functioning. Uh, as a predictive of uh, the long-term effect on disability. So this is again another very important area that we have to check for the future. So then to conclude, I can skip this. To conclude, I think that from first, uh, we should really do our best in order to try to pick up as early as possible the presence of uh, uh, progression phenomenon. Um, uh, PIRA could be very important from this point of view. However, PIRA has to be corrected by what I just uh, uh, told you before uh, in order to eliminate false progression. Concerning, and this is the last slide, concerning the uh, tools to monitor progression, unfortunately, uh, if you look here, uh, using like the traffic light uh, representation, no one of the measures has the, t the three green lights. So we have to work a lot again in this area. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Komi, uh, for that talk on understanding the progression in MS, uh, especially independent of relapses and MRI changes. If there are any questions, uh, please do. Many thanks, Giancarlo, for this update of the current knowledge we have uh, nowadays of multiple sclerosis. Uh, my, my question is, is in relation to PIRA. Do, do you think uh, PIRA, not sustained PIRA, but confirmed PIRA, could be uh, a primary endpoint uh, in uh, not only progressive MS trials, but also in relapse and remitting trials? Do you think it will give us more uh, sensitivity uh, to reach a um, clinically meaningful outcome? 
thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the question because it is a bit the central one. So I think that if uh, we really uh, uh, combine together the PIRA observation with the MRI observation so that we can really pick up what I define true PIRA, uh, then really this is a, a, is a very good tool and it could be used even in the future in clinical trials in order to explore the impact of any type of treatment uh, uh, on the uh, long-term risk of evolution of disability, particularly for disability evolution, which is independent uh, from uh, activity. So that, that the type of progression of disability, which is an expression of mechanism of neurodegeneration. If I have to organize a new trial in progressive MS, I think that I will use this. And, and also, I think that in the future, the clinical trial in progressive MS has to extend to the relapsing phase of the disease. Because it's there that we probably have more possibility to target the mechanism of neurodegeneration. Thank you very much once again, Professor Gorm. So we move on to the third uh, talk in the uh, symposium on advances in multiple sclerosis treatment by uh, Professor Hartun. Chairman, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure indeed to be back in your wonderful country. I greatly enjoyed last year's meeting uh, at this place and I, uh, I'm very appreciative of uh, having gotten another opportunity to uh, come here. So these are my uh, disclosures. I would like to talk about advances in MS treatment and you all have witnessed uh, an astounding evolution of treatments mainly for relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis over the past 30 or so years. I don't have to go uh, through all of them, you, need, uh, you uh, utilize them in your clinical practice, be it the initial injectables, the infusibles, the oral drugs. Uh, more recently, of course, the field uh, has been dominated by B-cell targeted uh, therapies. So uh, we have at our avail uh, a great toolkit to hit almost each and every target um, and checkpoint uh, in the immunopathological cascade of multiple sclerosis. Um, and these are uh, listed here. Still, we heard from Professor Comey and we are all painfully aware, we need uh, uh, treatments in particular to combat progressive multiple sclerosis. While we are doing quite a good job uh, uh, with uh, relapsing MS. So there is definitely room for improvement and uh, hence uh, my talk will also uh, look into the future, look at some uh, options that are appearing on the horizon or can be spotted using high resolution um, telescopes if you like. I've listed here uh, what I think this is a personal choice, our current and future therapeutic strategies. And one might um, uh, distinguish them into immunomodulatory cell therapies and remyelinating therapies. So let's uh, start with the immunomodulatory therapies. As I mentioned, a cornerstone of our current treatments are the B-cell directed therapies. And I like to refer to them as 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and I will uh, tell you what I mean by this. Of course, 1.0, the monoclonal antibodies that we have available from rituximab, ocrolizumab, uh, ofatumumab, and as I will very briefly uh, uh, talk about, uh, ublituximab, the uh, latest edition. Then uh, a, a brief and uh, in part sad 
um, discussion of uh, Bruton Tarrison kinases, and 3.0, the CAR CD19 T cell approach. There are the kinase inhibitors that will be pursued further uh, for establishing efficacy, like the uh, uh, YAK kinase inhibitor mazitinib, the RIPK1 blocker. There are new old immune interventional strategies, the DHODH inhibitor and the anti-CD40 ligand um, antibody. Uh, I think given the uh, prominent role that microglia play mostly in the progressive phase of multiple sclerosis, um, targeting them and finding uh, agents that uh, specifically address uh, their functionality uh, clearly uh, are in the center of ongoing uh, research. Um, then a dream, uh, the holy grail of immunologists is the reinstitution of the uh, uh, disturbed immune tolerance that gives rise to autoimmune uh, diseases. And uh, also, uh, given the uh, um, rekindled um, interest and the overwhelming evidence for an important role of EBV uh, in initiating or, or activating MS, there have been um, attempts to um, capitalize on this knowledge and devise appropriately uh, targeted uh, strategies. These are the autologous or allogeneic uh, CD8 T cells and vaccination uh, approaches, of course. As far as uh, cell therapies goes, there has also been a very uh, productive development over recent years in terms of further solidifying the role of autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Then, as I mentioned earlier, the CAR T cells. You will remember they uh, have been developed uh, for malignancies. And last year, uh, the Nobel Prize for medicine was almost given to the inventors of this approach, hadn't uh, uh, COVID-19 and the uh, uh, specific uh, vaccine uh, come in between. So pretty sure they will uh, receive it uh, sometime soon. Stem cells, again, embryonal adult induced pluripotent stem cells and <clears throat> T-cell vaccination. And of course, there is a whole field of remyelinating therapies that restore um, uh, damage uh, to the uh, neurons and axons. And I will just use an example. Uh, I cannot uh, um, uh, discuss the, uh, the whole field. So uh, coming back to the B cells, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, collected um, evidence among uh, multiple lines that B cells uh, are key in the pathogenesis of multiple uh, sclerosis across uh, the trajectories. Uh, the B cells uh, are uh, coming from uh, bone marrow. Uh, they turn into memory cells, can invade uh, the central nervous system. They can also uh, drive autoreactive T cells to home to the central nervous system. Um, and uh, they have been uh, incriminated as a critical determinant of the sustained uh, local and restricted immune response that you can see uh, in the sub uh, meningeal space during the progressive stages of multiple sclerosis. So different ways uh, to um, hit them, either by depleting, changing their uh, functions, um, are available uh, already now um, and are being uh, explored in the next uh, years. So I will just, uh, in terms of uh, B cell directed 1.0, mention the latest addition to the monoclonal antibody uh, D 
depleters of B cells that are available in the MS uh, armamentarium, the ublituximab uh, monoclonal anti-CD20 um, antibody and glyco-engineered one that uh, by its uh, properties promises to be a very uh, a strong um, um, killer using anti or utilizing antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. This is the uh, paper of the pivotal uh, twin phase uh, three trials published um, uh, 2021 in the New England Journal. And you can see here indicated by the blue arrows uh, the uh, massive uh, reduction in relapse rate by roughly 50% of ublituximab versus uh, the comparator uh, teriflunamide. There was also an impact on uh, disability and improvement. Of course, uh, uh, this was reflected in the MR metrics of disease activity here shown the secondary endpoint, the total number of GAD enhancing T1 lesions, and both in ultimate one and ultimate two, uh, one noticed a very significant decrease in uh, the number uh, when compared to teriflunamide, which you see uh, as uh, the brownish uh, columns and ubli as the blue columns, almost zero activity depictable. When I try to summarize other very important developments that we've uh, seen uh, over recent years, it's, it's the overwhelmingly robust, consistent evidence uh, uh, gathered both from registry data, real world um, evidence, to um, make the point that one should start treatment with high efficacy drugs earlier that one should treat early. We've known that for quite some time. Uh, but then uh, also with high efficacy drugs and not follow the sort of traditional escalating approach uh, where you use uh, in a sequence uh, more and more effective uh, drugs if appropriate responses are not achieved. So, I think there is now a, a, a great consensus amongst uh, the community that uh, even before some control trials will read out and they, by the time they will read out uh, and by the nature of their design, they cannot really uh, fully uh, answer the question in this uh, controlled um, manner. But I think the evidence is strong enough. Let me now turn to uh, a new drug uh, or old drug in new disguise, a second generation teriflunamide, or if you like, a third generation flunamide uh, that has been uh, studied in relapsing multiple sclerosis. This is Vidofludimus calcium, a dehydroorotate dehydrogenous blocker. Uh, this enzyme is crucial uh, for pyri pyrimidine synthesis in activated uh, T cells. And this is, uh, of, of course, the same as uh, we learned about uh, teriflunamide, that if you go from the resting state to the activated state, uh, there is an increased demand for pyri pyrimidine synthesis. Um, and this utilizes that um, enzyme. And if you uh, block this enzyme uh, by Vidofludimus, you uh, deplete the pyrimidine pole, uh, pool and there is an increase in metabolic stress signals to the activated uh, T cells. This finally results in a block of transcriptional uh, elongation, a decrease of pro-inflammatory T17, TH1 cytokines, and uh, by this uh, manipulation, you also drive these autoreactive T cells into apoptosis. Now, this has been studied uh, first um, um, in uh, a safety and immune effect uh, um, investigating uh, trial uh, where uh, the 
presumed immune effects uh, in actual fact materialized with vidofludimus. Uh, it was shown to be uh, uh, have a very good safety profile, and there was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled phase two trial uh, looking uh, at um, MR metrics of disease activity, and you can see on the left-hand uh, side uh, the impressive. I apologize for this semi-automatic uh, driving of my. Uh, presentation, the uh, difference between placebo in red and vidu fludimus in blue. Another uh, very interesting and very timely uh, approach centers on the interaction between two key co-stimulatory molecules, CD40 and its ligand. And these can truly be considered central master switches of immune activation. You see here that they are present on all relevant cellular components of the immune system, CD4 T cells, CD8 uh, T cells, B cells, uh, macrophages, monocytes, dendritic cells. So there is an opportunity by disrupting this interaction to uh, make a big impact on immune activation and its subsequent propagation. This uh, concept uh, has been um, studied for uh, therapeutic uh, utility in the Frexalimab uh, trial, an anti-CD40 ligand trial in relapsing multiple sclerosis. You can see here the uh, trial uh, design, a double-blind face and then an open label uh, uh, extension where uh, patients receive either low or high dose rexalimab, the uh, um, follow-up of, of the double-blind uh, uh, controlled uh, phase. Results were uh, presented by Patrick Vermeersch and I understand that uh, uh, there is a manuscript uh, uh, coming out uh, in published form soon. So the primary outcome was the number of new gut enhancing T1 lesions and adjusted relative lesion reduction versus placebo at week 12. And if you compare uh, uh, across the various uh, uh, randomized groups, there is a clear and market impact of uh, Frexalimab on uh, inflammatory activity <coughs> as uh, gleaned through MRI. And um, in line is the increasing proportion of uh, participants with no new lesions in the high dose Frexalimab arm through week 24, i.e. in the open label extension. So let me now turn my attention towards glial cells as therapeutic targets. Those that have their habitat in the central nervous system uh, where the damage uh, goes on. And let's focus uh, on uh, microglia uh, in this presentation. You know that microglia uh, has many uh, actions, uh, sometimes contradictory. Uh, they are basically protectors uh, uh, against damaging injurious attacks on the central nervous system um, and uh, represent a homostatic regulatory mechanism. There is evidence in MS from histologic work that uh, there is a deficiency of these homostatic uh, regulatory uh, microglia. They are characterized by a specific display of molecules. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, in their Janus phase properties, they display um, a pro-degenerative, uh, pro-inflammatory action, uh, mediated through, again, a range of molecules listed on the right-hand side. So there is opportunity to uh, change uh, the microglia phenotype from a destructive to a homeostatic regulatory one, and these are being explored. 
Now, the role of microglia, as I alluded to, has uh, come to the forefront when looking at uh, chronic uh, MS pathology and chronic microglial activation has been uh, invoked to contribute to MS pathology. It's associated with what is called smoldering disease or the slowly expanding lesions, loss of synapses, neurodegeneration and inhibition of remyelination. And of course there was the advent of a class of molecules that are expressed both in B cells and in microglia. So in the peripheral aspect of MS disease pathology as well as in the CNS part. Uh, this uh, enzyme, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, um, is a shared common signaling pathway. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, this is the B cell and um, activating this pathway results in a number of functions. On the other hand, if you block it, some of the detrimental effects uh, and properties of B cells are compromised. And similarly, uh, this holds for uh, monocytes microglia. Now, we uh, were all very uh, optimistic, and particularly um, in the field uh, uh, because of uh, pioneering work of Xavier Montalban in this phase two trial showing, particularly with the high dose, uh, uh, significant effect versus uh, placebo. And there was another uh, BTK inhibitor, tolebrutinib, that uh, under the guidance of uh, Dan Reich uh, uh, again showed uh, in a phase two uh, MR-based trial uh, uh, superiority uh, of uh, tolebrutinib in this instance in secondary progressive MS, relapsing secondary progressive MS. And again, the potential advantages of BTK inhibitors uh, would be the dual action in the periphery and the central nervous system, question mark. Now, there was a blow to, to the field when uh, Merck uh, in December released uh, uh, the data of the uh, two phase three trials in, of ibrutinib um, in relapsing multiple sclerosis. Um, clearly um, uh, a disappointment uh, and all clinical and R MR measures were consistently and robustly negative. So nevertheless, I think that we shouldn't give up the field. It's uh, very important. Inhibitors represent a class of agents, but they differ in uh, a number of factors, such as target specificity, selectivity, occupancy, they differ in CNS penetration and bioavailability, and in efficacy and safety. So I think it's prudent to wait and, and hope that the other multiple BTK inhibitor programs, both in relapsing and progressive forms of the disease, that will start reading out uh, this year and then in the subsequent years will uh, uh, yield uh, uh, positive results. Let me now come to more speculative uh, future uh, strategies based on uh, our understanding of the immunology and, and new tools uh, like mRNA vaccination. This is from a group that received uh, one received the Nobel Prize last year for the development of uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and they, um, uh, in a uh, pilot uh, trial in EAE, in MOG EAE, used a nanoparticle MOG mRNA um, uh, in MOG EAE, and they showed that uh, by uh, administering this, uh, the number of affected T cells uh, was uh, reduced um, uh, and there was a stimulation of the development of regulatory T cells. CAR CD19 T cells, another very interesting approach, studies are being conceived, are about to be embarked on. Uh, first of all, you know the uh, T cell receptor uh, structure 
this uh, so-called CAR T cells stands for chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells is uh, specifically um, manufactured to identify with one uh, introduced antigen receptor specifically and exclusively one antigen um, and these can be uh, produced, uh, first collecting via leukophoresis T cells, um, then uh, uh, infusing T cell expanded uh, cells uh, into the uh, patient and um, then looking at the immunological effects. Now, uh, the initial uh, uh, treatments were uh, delivered and shown to be effective uh, to patients with malignancies, uh, but there has also been now an extensive and ever-broadening uh, administration in autoimmune diseases. And the uh, first uh, clinical paper came out in Nature Medicine of an anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapy for refractory systemic lupus uh, erythematosus. In the animal model of uh, multiple sclerosis, EAE, on the left-hand side, it was shown by the San Francisco group that such an approach can diminish uh, severity uh, and clinical expression of EAE. Um, and uh, there is another paper that um, uh, uh, sort of could uh, reproduce these results. And um, uh, if one looks um, at the totality of trials on ongoing uh, also in autoimmune diseases, I think this is a legitimate approach and one that will uh, follow. Fundamental in the pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases is the breakdown of immunotolerance against the body's own antigens. And uh, as I mentioned, the holy grail for immunologists would be to reintroduce uh, immunotolerance. And there are a couple of, of uh, ways. One trial designed by uh, Roland Martin and, and colleagues, and they will be pursued and looked at uh, in terms of efficacy. We talked about MS progression and raw and PIRA. Professor uh, Comey uh, uh, did a uh, great job in uh, discussing this and one way to target the uh, pathobiology uh, of progressive MS is to foster remyelination. We learned about Clemastin, the rebuilt trial uh, that demonstrated in phase two uh, an effect on the visual impairment uh, subsequent to demyelination and uh, restoration of it uh, by clemastin, an, an old drug uh, established um, and repurposed for this uh, effect. Um, uh, last year there was another um, uh, study coming out from this trial looking at uh, the myelin water fraction as a measure of myelin integrity and in a way uh, uh, reflecting remyelination. And, uh, the uh, colleagues from UCSF showed that there was an increase of the lowered myelin water fraction in the corpus callosum by clemastin, as you see here in the pictures uh, of on therapy and, and off therapy. And one, I think, very uh, interesting trial is the maximized trial. Um, Robin Franklin's group has shown that the old established drug metformin restores uh, CNS remyelinating capacity by rejuvenating aged stem cells. You know, metformin is, is being studied for rejuvenating uh, tissues across the body, but here is one that specifically looks at remyelination. It's a very non-toxic drug, so. Uh, uh, very interesting to see the results of the phase two trial ongoing. Just briefly, don't go into the details, but a fantastic study from uh, San Rafaele looking at neurostem cell transplantation in uh, progressive MS. Uh, obviously, a, a pilot phase one uh, trial on, on few patients, but uh, some very interesting uh, results in terms of safety, which uh, was uh, met, and secondary outcomes, a dose-dependent reduction of brain atrophy uh, with these 
uh, intrathecally administered uh, fetal, human fetal uh, progenitor cells. And also, uh, in line with this, raised CSF levels of anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective molecules. Just two trials, no details, the Batsedoxifen phase two trial or re-wrap in a chronic optic neuropathy design. Again, this is a, an estrogen modulator approved to prevent a bone density loss in postmenopausal women, uh, a primary uh, uh, visual pathway directed trial and a liothurin in phase 1b open label trial uh, there is a broad literature on the effects of thyroid hormones in promoting remyelination uh, uh, preclinically. And finally, uh, just to mention it, I don't have the time to go into it, we learned uh, last year uh, how important EBV is in driving multiple sclerosis. There may be molecular mimicry underlying this, and of course, given the, uh, the accumulated evidence, one uh, would target EBV, and there are various ways. Vaccines are being studied. They take time. They take a lot of uh, patients, uh, high statistic power to uh, obtain results. And there are also there's a rekindled interest in using antiretroviral drugs to combat uh, EBV infection. And there have been uh, uh, attempts to uh, destroy EBV cells with CD8 cytotoxic cells against EBNA uh, T cells. Uh, this was pioneered by uh, Michael Pender, uh, and uh, these were autologous CD8 cells. This uh, is a trial by a company, ATA, uh, using allogeneic off the shelf EBV targeted T cells. However, uh, despite encouraging initial results, a recently uh, published, or not published, but uh, uh, press release on phase two showed uh, it didn't provide any, uh, any advantage or any uh, therapeutic efficacy. So I come back, I try to run you through this uh, uh, potpourri of approaches that are currently being pursued or can uh, be seen that may uh, forward our our field, I think uh, there is optimism. Uh, there are very interesting approaches targeting different aspects of MS pathobiology. So uh, I am um, uh, quite hopeful that we will be able to further um, expand our therapeutic armamentarium. And with this, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> um, Peter. We have time so for some questions. I can start, perhaps. <clears throat> the anti-CD40, uh, in theory, should have the advantage of a combination of, of target of innate and uh, acquired immunity, adaptive immunity. <clears throat> Was there any evidence from this phase two trial of a possible impact on the innate immunity because we saw a quite clear decrease of MRI activity, but was there any type of message? Uh, the tool was not, in, I mean, to look at uh, microglia activity, really the uh, proof of the pudding would be uh, PET studies to look at microglial uh, activation and microglial phenotype. Uh, this, I'm sure, is in, in the uh, Design plan, but uh, now it's only the phase two that will uh, that has looked at uh, at the uh, immediate uh, peripheral inflammatory activity. But you are uh, very right, and this is the charm of this approach that it has yeah. such a broad um, interaction. And so far, you know, there was a first trial with a first generation monoclonal that had significant side effects: uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, glomerulosclerosis. This one uh, lacks it, and so far there haven't been major uh, safety issues. Any other question? Yes, here in front. Do 
you think there is a place for combination therapy in time to come? Because at the moment, I mean, we are just targeting either CD20 and various uh, things along the line. Do you think such a thing is possible? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this, uh, in a way, obvious question. Uh, there are sort of now combination trials ongoing in the uh, BTK uh, um, uh, field. Um, previous uh, thinking was uh, dominated by uh, the uh, effects of the combination trial of um, Avonex and Natalizumab. Um, if one looked at it uh, in retrospect, uh, it was not the uh, correct interpretation, but you know, the occurrence of PML as a completely out of the blue was an argument taken to be particularly careful in designing which would otherwise be very sensible combination therapies. If you know that you can target different aspects of the pathobiology with different uh, agents that make sense and is being used in oncology you know, for many, many years. I think this has uh, impacted the field for a long time. I, there may be now uh, interest. It's then a question of how expensive uh, combination therapies would be. I mean, some of the drugs that could be used uh, are now generics, uh, have become cheaper, so that's maybe an obstacle disappearing. Uh, but again, from a theoretical standpoint, you are absolutely right. Uh, one should look into this. May I ask another question? Can, do you think we will ever get custom tailored? You know, like because in different MS patients, different processes may be driving. Sometimes it may be B cells, 70 percent, some other process. Do you think we will get the technology one day to be able to say like this is the ideal drug, or is it going to be like trial and error kind of thing? <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm relatively convinced or hopeful. Thank you, Professor Hartung. Uh, we come to the last lecture of this uh, European Chaco Foundation Symposium. <coughs> it will be delivered by uh, Professor Leticia Liocani. Uh, she's been a resource person at our SLC Dream sessions many times. And uh, she's going to talk to us on the enhancing recovery in multiple sclerosis, the role of uh, neuromodulation. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I thank the chairs and organizers for being here. Good morning, everyone. And uh, today we'll share with you my thoughts about what we can do besides drug uh, treatments. These are my disclosures, not related to my talk. Um, I will go through a quite dense outline um, resuming that um, we, I would like to start with the transcranial magnetic stimulation that was the first tool developed for uh, stimulating the brain and that was used uh, to measure cortical spinal integrity and to measure central conduction time because uh, high current intensities um, in a coil can uh, generate a magnetic field that is capable of depolarizing the motor cortex and evoke a potential on the muscle, depolarization on the muscle, and by measuring that, we can measure central conduction time by comparing this response with the peripheral stimulation at the spinal cord level. And uh, so this is used in diagnostics uh, to demonstrate demyelination um, along the corticospinal pathway, as in this case. But uh, after the use of this tool for um, several years, it was uh, apparent that uh, even in uh, people with no clinical symptoms related uh, or signs related to this uh, delay in conduction, uh, there could be the development of a subsequent uh, a motor deficit. And um, so personally, I used to show a slide of this 
of a case like this with no, absolutely no uh, motor deficits. And now I'm following the person of the, the slide I was obtaining uh, 20 years ago for uh, um, progressive MS. Uh, so uh, full recovery of a relapse doesn't mean full recovery of the pathway. Actually, having a delay now could uh, uh, predict uh, um, clinical signs later because a demyelinating lesion is going to have uh, maybe two processes. As we saw uh, earlier this morning, um, demyelination can apparently recover but uh, keep expanding quite slowly. So. Um, there is a smoldering inflammatory activity, but even if the lesion is um, not uh, still uh, being slowly expanding, there could be degeneration processes in a demyelinated axon. So both these events can lead to a future um, worsening of the clinical features. And actually, several years ago, we had found that having motor hypopotential abnormalities could predict worsening on the motor functional system uh, between two and five years later. Of course, this was a mixed uh, cohort of patients, but in, uh, when, even when focusing in early MS with uh, only demyelination in the motor uh, pathway with uh, delayed motor evil potentials, the disability would be worse uh, as predicted by the the test uh, even after two years. So this, um, these are phenomena that are not as slow as we think and they can also explain the PIRA we discussed earlier. But we can also use them to measure um, modifications and plasticity occurring uh, in the motor cortex uh, by, for example, mapping uh, of the uh, motor area and the shaping uh, of it um, across conditions. Uh, this is just an example of uh, healthy people. Even being right-handed is reshaping our hand motor cortex because the left uh, hand uh, is uh, being less active than the right and this is also reflected in our representation of the motor cortex. That's in right-handed people. And uh, that's in piano players, so that even what we do is reshaping the, the motor cortex. But also diseases are reshaping it, and also in acute fashion by changing the excitability, as occur, it occurs uh, in the acute stages within a week of a relapse, where the hand affected by the relapse is um, difficult to um, measure with TMS with the low responses, but the contralateral hand, the healthy hand, has a corresponding hyperexcitability of the brain, which is also uh, restored uh, and rebalanced uh, with recovery, both spontaneous and associated with rehabilitation. And we demonstrated a few years ago that uh, the um, hyperexcitability of the healthy hand is also predictive of the future recovery and the rebalance of the, of the two hemispheres. So there is also some prediction on the results of rehab and uh, spontaneous recovery. But uh, the newer approach was to use uh, these methods to change the plasticity, not to just measure it. And the first application of uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to change the plasticity of the brain was the application in psychiatry in major depression where uh, the mm, same stimulation but applied at high frequency in trains of about two seconds for 20 minutes could uh, change the excitability of the uh, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and um, you can see it's been quite a long time since the psychiatrists in the US were allowed to use this tool to counteract the effects of uh, major depression when a single drug did not work. And we are very much behind in neurology, um, so I think it's time to get some approval for neurological applications, also because if we consider uh, improving motor function, uh, even the subthreshold uh, stimulation, so 
in the motor cortex, we can use the repetitive below the intensity that is evoking the movement. Uh, but still, we can see an activation of the same motor network that we activate when we perform voluntary movements. So even sub-threshold, this is a quite a powerful simulation. And I uh, participate into a big meta-analysis um, for the use of uh, transcranial magnetic simulation in the repetitive modality. And uh, again, uh, from our data, we're a bit uh, behind uh, in the approval. We're at the level B of evidence, but still um, there is some hope that we can get um, approval, at least uh, we're working on that, for improving uh, uh, leg motor function in MS. But I think it's not enough to think about simulating the, the brain to get plasticity because a powerful simulator of brain plasticity is motor training, motor activity. Um, think about the example of piano playing is reshaping our hands. So even training and uh, rehabilitation is going to reshape uh, the motor cortex of people with MS and potentially counteract the detrimental effect of neurodegeneration and axonal damage. And uh, uh, my colleague uh, Centonze um, quite a few years ago demonstrated that it is much better to perform uh, exercise training plus uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation than either one of the two things. And also in our uh, group, uh, I use the example of stroke because that's the example where I had the chance to compare what happens if we use the brain simulation alone, you get a meaningful effect in a third of your patients, while if you just add a little bit of activity and uh, cycling uh, during the simulation, so it's like 20 minutes cycling um, uh, for 11 sessions, so it's not much, but it was capable of inducing uh, a meaningful effect, clinically meaningful, in a uh, um, two-thirds of the patients, and that's in two different uh, works. Um, so we followed this approach in people with MS, and we did not deliver stimulation alone, but only in people who were undergoing intensive neurorehabilitation as inpatients, which means twice a day, every day. And on top of this, we delivered 11 sessions uh, of uh, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation over the lower limb, motor cortex, and um, at the end of the three weeks, there was not a big difference. So if we had a clinical trial only targeting the end of treatment, we would not find um, interesting results. Uh, we would find uh, consistent uh, negative results, as Professor Hartung said about other treatments. But maybe we should follow these people longer, not at the end of treatment, but for a couple of more months. And that, that's when we saw that um, while the effects of rehab were going uh, down back again to baseline in the six minutes walk test, uh, the people who underwent the brain simulation kept improving even when they were at home. So they were uh, maybe practicing uh, their walking or they had the more stable plastic changes, I don't know. So we're starting another study with uh, monitoring with the uh, um, wristwatch if the patients keep improving because they walk more or because the brain is uh, consolidating the plastic changes occurred during rehab. But what is for sure is that uh, mm, people discharged with no simulation went back to the, what their condition before they entered the, um, the, sim the rehabilitation program. So we can consider this as a consolidator of uh, the improvements. But again, we can go back and use, uh, again, the classical TMS for inducing motor evo potentials to predict the response to this combined approach. And actually what we found was that people with absent motor evo potential were behaving almost like people who had the sham simulation, so apparent fake simulation, the placebo simulation, while the ones who improved um, meaningfully were only those with still some uh, motor evoke potentials uh, when uh, the single stimuli were delivered uh, um, um, supra-threshold 
So this means that we can use a, a corticospinal conduction with the classical motor potentials as a discriminant between uh, people with um, enough corticospinal pathway to work on um, to promote uh, uh, brain plasticity uh, through the uh, brain stimulation in addition of rehabilitation. But in another cohort of people who are undergoing uh, um, open label um, transcranial magnetic stimulation in a repetitive modality over the leg motor cortex plus rehabilitation in our rehab clinic, we found that uh, um, there was a difference between uh, people who um, did respond well and people who did not improve quite a lot after this combined approach. And those who responded well were those who had uh, um, reduced uh, uh, motor threshold intensity, so less uh, intensity was needed to reach um, the appearance of a motor evoke potential across the first uh, uh, five sections. And th those with um, more uh, increased cortical excitability over five days were the ones who improved better in uh, um, the combined uh, TMS and rehabilitation approach. So not only corticospinal reserve can predict improvement, but also the uh, plasticity reserve. But there is another reserve that um, Professor Comey mentioned earlier this morning, which is the assessment of the um, neurodegeneration using optical coherence tomography. And we found that um, although we are measuring a totally different pathway because we are measuring axonal loss in the optic nerve, patients with um, high degenerative uh, mechanisms and, I mean, high neurodegeneration in the optic nerve were the ones who responded less even to the transcranial magnetic stimulation plus rehabilitation, um, suggesting that we can have a sampling of a neurodegeneration across the whole nervous system by looking at the optic nerve and uh, have some prediction on how much axonal reserve is there uh, because um, the idea is that um, low axonal reserve in the optic nerve means low axonal reserve um, in a widespread um, a manner so that uh, these patients are going to respond less even to the rehab targeting the lower limb, which is quite a, far away from the optic nerve. And I would like to move to another uh, neuromodulation technique, which is uh, maybe applied more recently with less results on gait in people with MS, but applied in many other uh, environments, uh, which is the transcranial direct current stimulation, where current uh, is delivered in uh, two different directions. You can deliver anodal currents or cathodal, depending on uh, which electrode you place in the area of interest. But what is quite uh, established is that cathodal stimulation is related to decrease in the neuronal firing, while anodal in increase in, anode, in uh, neuronal firing compared with no stimulation. This is a cat um, cortex with the neuronal firing measured. And so that we can say anodal is excitatory stimulation and cathodal is inhibitory. There, um, the advantage of um, TDCS is that you can apply it also in the preclinical environment and so measure much better the underlying mechanisms and uh, mechanisms underlying plasticity with the electric currents have been also related to the um, transcription uh, effects in, uh, in uh, mice and uh, particularly uh, BDNF uh, is, has been uh, so far the main focus of, uh, of uh, the um, changes in uh, uh, production at the neuronal level. But of course, I, I think we need to expand our portfolio of molecules under investigation. But concerning uh, the main application of TDCS, um, traditionally uh, there is a sort of a habit of using a five days course in uh, um, this type of technique, but just I think it was just because the 
the pioneers in this technique use five days and with um, many successful results concerning fatigue. So uh, there are many studies that have kept uh, applying this uh, approach in the study of fatigue and uh, so we already have a meta-analysis showing uh, a positive effect. So I think it's time to move from fatigue to other other applications. Mm, there have been uh, some successful applications in pain, again this five days uh, thing. And uh, luckily for us uh, in the field of rehabilitation, the trials have been quite longer, about 10 days at least. It's a good, uh, good improvement. And uh, so there were some success in improving the effects of cognitive rehabilitation by two different groups, uh, one in Brescia and one in New York. And the advantage of this approach is that you can also use it at home while this is not the case for a transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you can do also remote cognitive rehab plus um, uh, TDCS. But uh, also in this field, uh, there is um, a demonstration of effects on brain plasticity. And so even in healthy people, uh, the excitatory stimulation when, perf when delivered during a motor training uh, was demonstrated to lead to a better improvement. This is a hand-skilled uh, uh, finger task. Um, better and more uh, stable, longer-lasting improvement in the people undergoing the real stimulation compared with sham. And so this has led also to many applications in sports, mainly in the US, and there was this company that advertised their uh, TDCS stimulator, like, uh, you know, ear cuff, uh, earphones. But uh, actually the stimulating part is uh, these electrodes on the motor cortex. But I have to say, someone went to see what these teams did, and basically they did not win anything. So maybe it's not enough to buy a tool to, to improve, but you have to, uh, of course, test the tool against placebo and uh, use it in the right way, like uh, any weapon or drug. Uh, it's not enough to buy the drug, you have to know how to give it. And so the last part of my talk, I have five minutes less, uh, is related to maybe other mechanisms that are not brain plasticity only, because we are talking about MS, and as we saw this morning, inflammation, degeneration, and demyelination are quite relevant. And so maybe, um, what are the effects on remyelination? There were many suggestions that electric currents can uh, increase uh, uh, remyelination. This is not about electric current, this is about optogenetic uh, stimulation, but if, again, the electrical activity of the neurons can also promote its myelination. That's been demonstrated also by the Lubetsky group in uh, developing neurons. If you block their activity, they will not be, the, they will not be myelinating to, to begin with. And so, but mm, subsequently, um, effects on microglia migration have been demonstrated by electric currents in vitro. And uh, also in vitro, um, the electric currents were capable of uh, simulating the elongation of axons and also the uh, myelination, uh, again, in vitro, but uh, in uh, MS models, even in preclinical models, we have to face another problem, which is inflammation. Uh, inflammation, we know, leads to excitotoxicity. So are we sure we want to excite these neurons that are already stimulated by inflammation to fire more than normal and to degenerate? Um, I was asking myself what to do in people with MS, and I was thinking that there was a study in stroke uh, suggesting that I mean, applying um, direct current stimulation in people after stroke, uh, excitatory stimulation. And this trial, although it was not very small, failed uh, totally. And uh, if you go into preclinical studies, there was an application of uh, excitatory currents, but they were good in improving motor function in mice and preserving tissues uh, only when applied late, one week after the event. And I was thinking also that in stroke, uh, nobody is uh, thinking of 
increasing the brain activity but in reducing the brain activity. One of the most uh, explored approaches is hypothermia. So I was thinking that maybe we should induce a sort of uh, electrical hypothermia, not hyper activity. And so actually we tried with the group of uh, Professor Martino in a preclinical model that they were using for other purposes of uh, a stroke. And um, I convinced them to try with currents because uh, the idea was that maybe we need inhibitory currents. And that was the case in uh, this model. So if you give excitatory currents during the acute phases, you don't do any better, you can increase hemorrhages, and so you want to inhibit. So maybe this is the case also in acute MS. So we use the platform that we use both in humans and in mice, which is the visual platform allowing us to measure visual potentials and uh, OCT. And of course, in the preclinical model, we can use histology. So I'm still scared in um, stimulating people with acute relapses, so we tried in the preclinical environment. And in the preclinical environment also allows you to deliver the stimulation after the immunization and before the inflammation appears, because you know when it's going to happen. So you can see demyelination seven days in the visual level potentials, and uh, the motor um, relapse will appear about a week later. So the optic nerve is affected much earlier than the spinal cord. And actually, the inhibitory stimulation was the one that prevented the black line, um, the, the red line, that prevented the development of a delay in visual level potentials um, that is really minor, uh, close to the healthy mice, uh, while the mice undergoing the excitatory stimulation uh, actually had a similar demyelination um, compared with the mice with the only fake uh, placebo stimulation, so no stimulation. And um, this also was related to less uh, uh, representation of uh, uh, abnormal paranodes, like if you have a single paranoid um, across a node of Ranvier, it means uh, that one of the two is missing, and uh, this uh, um, type of asymmetric paranodes was uh, much reduced only when we delivered the inhibitory stimulation, not with the excitatory stimulation. So we went into the, the model um, where we stimulated after the appearance of a demyelination of VEP delay for 10 days to see whether we could improve and induce remyelination. And that was the case for both treatments. So when there is a already a demyelination there, you can improve the demyelination, so reduce the latency of uh, VEPs in the optic nerve of mice, but only the inhibitory stimulation was capable of reducing the microglial activation and was capable of uh, delaying the appearance of the motor signs one week later and uh, of reducing microglia in the spinal cord. So again, in the preclinical models of MS, uh, we have to also face inflammation. And so maybe we want to precede the uh, excitatory stimulation with inhibitory stimulation to reduce inflammation, which of course you don't need if you only have a pure demyelination model like uh, the Cuprison, where we only tried the anodal stimulation with successful improvement in visual level potentials in the Cuprison mice. So to conclude, I think um, we need to work a lot before going into patients to study the effects on inflammation because, of course, you don't want inflammation to become worse in your patient. But it is quite clear that if you want to promote plasticity in chronic conditions, a good approach would be to uh, stimulate the brain with the excitatory modality and couple it with uh, uh, training, whatever cognitive or motor uh, even dancing is possible if you use a TDCS. So with this, uh, I really thank you for your attention and I invite you to join us in Milano. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sure uh, Professor Liukani would be happy to take a few questions. 
Uh, is there a role for cannabinoids in uh, spasticity and uh, pain? Here? Oh, thank you for this question. Cannabinoids are quite uh, relevant because uh, they reduce uh, spasticity and the pain related to it, not only isolated pain, but also the one worsened by, uh, spas by spasticity. And um, there is an interesting um, um, possibility that cannabinoids also improve brain plasticity. So actually, we started, we did not finish yet, um, a study using brain stimulation together with cannabinoids to see whether that could be a good combination. So thank you very much for your question because I really like the question about combined approaches. So we should not forget that combining brain stimulation with rehabilitation is not the only combination that we need. We also need to combine with the appropriate drugs such as this one. Thank you. Um, Letizia, may I ask you a question? Um, is, is there possible to think about uh, the stimulation of uh, spinal cord? So if I have an acute uh, lesion in the spinal cord, uh, based on what you have shown in the experimental models, uh, is there a possibility to try to target the acute lesion, the inflammatory uh, component of the lesion, in order to try to have some uh, improvement in the recovery. Is this first technically feasible? Uh, and then is there any data until now about such a possibility? Mm. Thank you for this question. Technically, it is possible because there are already papers on the stimulation of the spinal cord uh, but that's to excite uh, the, the neuronal networks and improve plasticity. So the application was the excitatory uh, manipulation to improve pain and spasticity. And for this, that is quite promising. I'm not aware of the approach of the opposite direction to reduce inflammation, but actually uh, I'm not aware of groups that are using inhibitory stimulation in people to reduce inflammation, so I think we should start. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so when uh, the brain is damaged and the circuitry is malfunction, by externally stimulating with either a magnetic stimuli or a direct current, is there a possibility that you can further aggravate? Because you are, rather than you determining, you are actually externally driving, that's one. And other thing is like, what is the proposal, mechanism in which you actually improve? Is it shifting of circuits or is there some facilitation of free myelination? Do we understand anything, how the transmagnetic stimulation actually improves outcomes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, it is possible that we can worsen inflammation with excitatory stimulation. That is why we perform these uh, trials in people who are in the hospital and where we already know they have no active lesions. We never simulated in excitatory modality people with active lesions to avoid the, the issue you're mentioning. And uh, although the goal should be, um, the theoretical one should be to improve uh, brain activity, to uh, improve plasticity, so reorganization in the cortex, but also potentially remyelination of the demyelinated pathway. Uh, the preclinical work on microglia, inflammatory cells, uh, could also suggest uh, that uh, there could be an effect that, of course, could be detrimental, so that's why we avoid in uh, uh, active lesions. But we had no reactivation of lesions in any patients that we treated, and we are over 200 now, I think 300. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, once again. And uh, that brings to an end the first uh, symposium, uh, ECF symposium on MS. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Professors uh, Montalban, Professor Comey, Professor Hartung, and Professor uh, Leokani for their contributions for this uh, symposium. So now we break for tea for half an hour, and we'll be back for the uh, MOG antibody related disorders symposium after that. Thank you very much. <laughs>